What you're about to watch is Messianic Torah teaching in classes. I enjoy teaching from the rabbinical and biblical teachings of the Hebrew Bible, not just the American Bible, the Hebrew Bible. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. There is a Bible verse that says, it is easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to make it into heaven. Well, in America, the eye of a needle is this little tiny needle with the head that you have to put the thread through. How can a camel fit through that? It seems impossible, which means that no rich people make it to heaven. That's not true. Very, very wrong in the natural way, in the Western way of thinking. But if we study the word according to the culture in which it was written in, which is the Hebrew, Aramaic, as well as Greek, we understand what the eye of a needle really is. It's the fence or the gate around a city. And the needle, the eye is the opening. The needle is the fence, the eye is the opening, it's an arch opening. The camel has to get down on its belly and crawl through. Why would Jesus use that as an example for who makes it into heaven and who doesn't? What's that got to do with that? The camel is an example of what we need to do. Get all the junk off our back and out of our mind. Get on our face before God and pray our way into heaven. He knows a relationship with Him is the only key to making it into heaven. So He used the camel and He wanted us to study the Hebrew to know what the eye of the needle really was, to let you know that rich people do make it into heaven. Once they set their money behind them and their possessions behind them and they put Yeshua HaMashiach first. Who is Yeshua HaMashiach? He is Jesus Christ, the risen Son of God. I is a blood Jew with a high uh, number, if you will, percentage of Jew in me. I'm so pleased. I am privileged to bring you the Hebrew teachings and teach you about the feast, which you'll see on these teachings. I teach you about all seven feasts what they mean and what they mean to you. I also teach you about astronomy, not astrology, astronomy. The devil has astrology, God has astronomy. It's amazing what we can learn right here from the Word of God. And you see when you pick this up and you start reading it and reading it and reading it and reading it, it eventually goes from your head to your heart. And it's to me it's more fascinating than television. This is more creative than television. As a matter of fact, television got its ideas from the 66 books of the Bible. Have you ever heard of Beam Me Up, Scotty? Star Wars? Star Trek? All that? Come on. It came from the Word of God when the rapture happened. God beamed them up. <laughs> if you want to put it in those terminologies, every, every, even the evil things that the evil people used to do came from the Word of God that you see on television. So why not go to the root and get blessed while you're doing it? The world doesn't bless you to watch their stuff, but God blesses you when you spend time in His stuff. So please take, the, take a moment and listen and learn about the Messianic Torah teachings over and over and over again. We teach how they affect your life and how the windows of heaven are open over your life on certain days so you can be blessed, especially on those days. Take a listen. Good morning, church! Good morning! Everyone shout hallelujah! One more time, hallelujah! Now turn to your neighbor, and if you don't have one, look at the angel sitting next to you. And tell him, I was glad when they said unto me, Okay, who's got their Bibles tonight? Who? One, two, three, okay. Yeah. Boy, you did good. All right. Heavenly Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for blessing these precious people. We open this Torah Messianic teaching tonight with your Holy Spirit. I thank you for you are a shelter in the time of trouble. You turn messes into miracles. And Lord, we thank you that you will give every one of these people in this room 
that serve you, that read their Bible and pray, double good for all their trouble. In Jesus' mighty, powerful name, everyone said, amen. If I can have you all show your Bibles. There they are. Oop. Oh, look at that. Sorry. There goes the eraser. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So I'll put this on the back of me. Everyone has their Bibles? Okay, say thank you, Lord, for giving me this Torah. Amen. And I pray that it blesses me all the days of my life as it blessed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And for all of you watching in, in, uh, throughout the world and on the Internet, this is in. Are you back there? Thank you. <laughs> We're in Buena Park, California, and we'll just begin our Messianic class in Hebrew. Baruch Ata Adonai Elohim Melech Ha'alam Asher Ki Shadow Babitz Fatab Det Si Baram Ba Asot Beri Gre Torah. I thank you, Father, for this Torah, which is the foundation of the rest of the Word of God. We cannot have it without its foundation. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Maybe you could even just hang it on there. That's okay, too. Okay, I always forget to put it on till last. So we're studying the Torah, and tonight we have half teaching and half movie. And let me just give you a clip of the movie. There is a man named Ron Wyatt who lived to be 66 years old. There are 66 books in the Bible, and he lived to be 66 years old. And so there's a purpose. When our purpose on, on, on this earth is fulfilled, the Lord takes us. They always say, the good die young, please. God knows who he has called to do a certain thing, and when their assignment is done, he either allows them to live. He's the boss, we're not, okay? So he either allows them to live or, or, or go on. This word here, okay, is called hey asad. You say it, hey asad. Hey asad. We, we, say, we say the foundations... Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is the first five books of the Bible. Without the first five books, the rest don't make sense. And what we do, just remember I showed you a couple of books before, my Hebrew Bible? Well, let me show you my Hayasad. Okay? Now, these are a little expensive books. So I'd hand them out, but I can't, okay? But nonetheless, this is my Torah foundation teaching, one of my books that we have in the library, Hayasad, and it literally means... Exactly, exactly, and Torah, you, he just said it, is the first five books, okay, and then they're going to say, well, so what, first five books, so what, you're going to say, no, that's the Hay Asad, without the Hay Asad, the rest falls apart, okay, you hear many people say, well, what's their foundation, they're teaching this, what, what's their background, what's their foundation, what Lutheran, or are they Lutheran, are they Baptist, are they Mormon, are they Jehovah Witness, are they whatever, and they'll want to know what's their Hay Asad, because then they're going to know how they think. So we, when we study our Bible, we tell everyone the foundation is the Hay Asad. Okay. Last week, for all of you watching on television, we studied about God's astronomy. Can anyone tell me what the difference is in a short sentence? Because there's a vast answer to this. What's the difference between opening up your horoscope and studying um, astronomy. astronomy as opposed to ast astrology? Yes. Okay, he said the answer. Astrology is the devil, and astronomy is God. What's the difference and why? Okay, okay, so, so, so God threw the universe into existence, Whew. and the devil had to go, oh, I hate God. He fired me from heaven, from being the worship leader. He had two positions, and a third of my angels are with me, and we're all miserable. Of course, he wants his job back, and he can't have it back. So he wants to destroy everything that God makes, including human beings. So what he did was he saw it, and he thought, ooh, I can twist it. He can't create, but he can manipulate. So he took 
the astrology, astronomy of God and copied it to astrology. Yes. Exactly. It has to do with the stars, the planets, the first and second and third heavens. Okay? And also the... the so like the devil has no power whatsoever because he's been defeated. The only part that he has is what we give him. Thank you. He said it. Ooh. The devil has no power unless we give it to him. And unfortunately, we're born with a little devil on our back, so it's our job to get the little devil off our back. We take a shower, right? Even if we waited a week to take a shower. I know some people that wait a week. Eventually they go, geez, I think I need a shower. It's the same way in the spirit realm. Your ghost that was in you, it needs a shower. And when you take a shower, a spirit leaves, and a spirit leaves, and you take on the Holy Spirit. You put fresh clothes on. Yes. So what you give, that's what he used to know. What you don't just go up, that's what he used Correct. And he multiplies it and multiplies it. You got it. He, he was, he was, and I want to have you come up in a little bit if we have time. Yes. Yes. Can I say something? Yes. See, what God wants you to do is to stay in the word. Yes. See, the word will fill you up with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit fights the devil to fire the fiery red dog from you. Keep, keep the armor on so you can fight the devil. Amen. When you, when, you, when you don't stay in your word, this is what happens to you. You, you start thinking worldly things, and then you end up, the devil can attack you more hard. Yeah. And then he'll, he'll try to overcome you because he'll be, you're fighting the flesh. With you. Can you please stand up here and say that with this microphone? Are you embarrassed? Okay, I'll, I'll explain it if you don't want to, but if, if, he, if you can. He's saying, stay. what do we say every time you come in here? Who has their Bible? That we even reward you when you memorize your Bible. Because we know when you stay in the Word, the devil has to leave you alone. You'll see numerous videos after videos after videos of demons talking through people that say, all he does is pray. All he does is worship. But you'll never hear a demon say, all he does is read his Bible. Never. Because as soon as you open up that Bible, you have to get your mind off of everything else and you focus on it. And if you, y'all, if somebody comes along and offers you drugs or offers you something and you have, you're thinking about it later, you learn to say, no, hey, no, 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 get out of here, man. I used to, but I don't anymore. No, thanks. That's a good thing. That's the first victory. The second thing is you have to get your mind off of it. So start, start whistling, start singing a song and get your mind on the song and get your mind on the words of the song so you're not thinking about what you could have done. If, you walk, if a pretty girl walks by and you think you men are going to, hmm, or for you ladies, if you're looking for a husband and you're like, hmm, get your mind off of it and think of a worship song. Don't think of a demonic song. Think of a worship song. And you'll notice, everyone say right now, okay, somebody think about something. Let's just think about something. Now, be thinking about that. Now, follow me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Are you still thinking about that? No. Because you're now, oh, oh, I'm singing amazing grace. And you're trying to think of what's the next that saved a wretch like me. It stops the devil. Worship and word. Worship and word. Stop the devil. All he wants is your mind. And if he can get your mind, y'all, he can get your mouth. And if he can get your mouth, he can get your heart. And if he can get your heart, he can get your hands. And if he can get your hands, he can get your feet. And then he's got you. Come on. Starts right here. So when the thought comes in, amazing grace. Or start thinking of a song that you can't even remember the words to and you'll start thinking of the music, okay? So what we're studying tonight, we're finishing up what we did last week and there's so much more to it and I'm going to give everyone a copy that has been faithful in this class. But God's astronomy, God threw the planet and the devil went, hmm, how can I play with this? Well, let's see, I'll come up with an excuse like they can't marry this person because they're this sign. They can't marry this person... Oh, they should marry this person. And actually, it's the opposite. Because the devil's a liar. So you, if you read your horoscope, if you have to go to a psychic or a palm reader, or hear little, even, even your little fortune cookies, all of them are a plot and a pit from the devil. I'm not, I'm not teaching astronomy so you can go look at astrology. I'm teaching astronomy so you go, yuck, to astrology. You realize you don't need your horoscope. You don't need anything to do with what the devil says. 
you are to marry or what your day is or the, the stars are aligned just right. No. This is your daily guide. Give us our daily bread. Okay, so now let's go back to this real quick. Our God's astronomy, everyone has a sign. So the devil had to use God's signs and say, hmm, let me play with them. We have found out through Hebrew study, okay, that those signs are for a sign to you. They're not a sign to tell you what to, they're for a sign for you to say what Bible verses are attached to those signs. And the Hebrew studies have attached Bible verses to every sign, and that actually tells you what your call is in your life. You go, that's why I like to do that stuff. And I'm telling you the truth. If you have demons on your back, you're not going to be in your call. You're going to go, boy, that is not me. That is not me. That's because you're outside of the umbrella of protection. But once you get in to your call, oh, it all makes sense. That's why I like to do this. Pisces, for instance, there's three or four Pisces in here. One, two, you are two. Sir, did you know three? Man, okay, four. Do you know that all of you are supposed to be leaders and elders in a church? You are the go-between, between the pet people in the pew and the pastor. So you have to study the word. You have a call. Here's the truth. When you do good, you get more blessing than the rest. But when you do bad, you get more punishment than the rest. Now, hold on. Aries is the ones up here in the pulpit. Not Aries, I apologize. What am I saying? I cancel that in Jesus' name. No, it's Aquarius are the ones in the pulpit. Okay? So the Pisces helps the Aquarius to help all the rest of them. Okay? I happen to be an Aquarius. And when I was modeling for Miller beer and Coors beer, excuse me, and Sears catalog, some beautiful lady came to me and said, what are you doing? God sent me all the way from over there to come to you. And she said, girl, you think you're so tough. I'm tougher than you. She said, if you don't get on God's track, you will be dead by midnight tonight. And the first time she said it, I flipped her off and said a few funny words until she said it again. Okay, test God. And she told me then, Weren't you born? Wasn't it your sign in the stars to preach the gospel? I said, whatever. All you religious people sound the same. I was so mean and sarcastic and disrespectful and prideful until I stepped into my call. And I actually forgot about what she said until I went to look at God's astronomy one day and went, wow, no wonder I love doing what I do. So all you Pisces, you're actually supposed to be in the front row. And you're the ones that are supposed to hand the oil to the pastor to anoint your head. You said, get oil. A couple other people said, can we have, I have holy water too. Not for tonight, that's for deliverance class. But eventually, when it's okay, we have to just clear it through, through uh, protocol. I'd like to put a little canister over there of, of oil or holy water for all of you. So when you walk in the door, you can anoint your head. Okay? This is a church after all, and there's drugs out there, and you have to have the power to say no. Now, if you want to do them down in State of Brothers or down the street, that's fine, but not on church property, because there's a curse on your life for anyone that passes them out or accepts them. On church property, it's God's ground, and don't be surprised if everything you're doing just gets flushed right down the toilet. You never disrespect God. So this oil, I'd like to, if I can, all of you who want to have their on their head tonight. Yes, because you know what? When you put it on there, oh, the Lord loves it. They care to have my mark. This represents the Holy Spirit, okay? So you put the Holy Spirit on your forehead, and that's where the devil looks. He wants to get your mind. So a lot of times it's good to even do it before you go to bed, and the first thing you do in the morning when you wake up. I apply the blood of Jesus and the fire of the Holy Spirit on me. The whole armor of God. No weapon formed against me prospers it. Any tongue, any gossiping tongue that rises up against me in judgment has already been condemned and proven to me wrong. This is my heritage as a child of the king. Yes, ma'am. Actually, it's, we prayed over it. But it can be any kind of oil. As long as it came from the grocery store and not some yucky place, okay? Then we blessed it, okay? And it's the same way with water. Those priests... 
that have water, that's the same drinking water you have, but they prayed or they spent time and said, Lord, you anoint this. So when I walk in, it's their faith mixed with God's water or oil and your faith. It's a sandwich. Have you ever tried to eat a sandwich with everything hanging out and there's no other piece of bread? Doesn't work. That's why I'm here having you. Do you have your Bibles? Because I know your sandwich is necessary, okay? You have a part to play too or it will not work. All right? So before we leave tonight, anyone that wants their head anointed with oil, I have one, one, two, three, four, five, six. Deanna, can you do me a favor real quick? Seven? I want to do it right now. And if you can play thou, O oh Lord, while I do it, and then we'll start. Then I, then I want to do the signs real quick. I have three signs left. We'll be patient, and then we have an awesome movie. Let me explain. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the Brooklyn Tabernacle Come on up, Choir. come on up, come on up. Who wants their head? In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Grace of Mama Mahakova Pahakai. He felt it. Richard felt it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. God bless you. Ima Mahasek, a man of God. Mighty man of God. Yes, Mama Mahakova Mahasek. Rosa Baba Bahakima Mahase in Jesus' name. Isa Mama Mahako Baba. Isa Baba Mahakima Mahase. I find the bread of the Mighty man of God. Mighty man of God. Get in line with his word. He's got a lot for you to do. Isa Mama Mahake Mama. Thank you, Mama. She felt it. She felt it. Catch her. Somebody catch her. Isa Baba Bahako. Isa Mama Mahake. Mama, may your problems, may your problems go away. Be blessed, Mama. Be blessed, Mama. Thou, oh Lord, somebody sing. Out of she, for me, Mama. Powerful woman of God. I don't care what they say about you. I don't care what you did five minutes ago. Mighty woman of God in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody help, Mama, Mama, say. So, Mama, 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 say. Richard, or can you stand behind me, please? Mama, Mama, Yes, please. Rosa Mama Mahake. Isa Baba Mahake Mama Mahase. Precious Mama Mahake. Isa Mama Mahake Baba Mahako. Rosa Mama Mahase. Oh my goodness. Okay, Mama. Isa Mama Mahake Baba Mahase. In Jesus' mighty name. Oh, oh, the Holy Spirit's all over her. Deanna, get up here. Help me, please. Yes, Mama Mahakoma Mahase. Yes, Mama Mahakoma Mahase. Let him go. Let him pick somebody up. Let him go. Yes, Mama Mahakoma Mahase. Sir, can you help me, please? Yes, Mama Mahakoma Mahase. Yes, Mama Mahakoma Mahase. Let him go. Let him go. Amen. Let him down. Now, y'all, come over here. Come over here. Come over here. Mama, 
bangs up. Oh, my God. Oh, He's from my mama. Where's your beautiful son? In Jesus' name, power, power, power be on you, mama. Power like never before. To say no, may your blessings overflow. In Jesus' name. I saw you owning a storage Ladies and gentlemen, you let's welcome it. the Brooklyn Tabernacle you Choir. It. You don't have one in there? You own it. You're a businessman, a very wise businessman. And your money comes easy to you. Wow. Watch the Lord bless you. And be healed in Jesus' name, sir. Pray from the back. In Jesus' mighty name, Father. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. God bless you, sir. Young man, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't you worry. Angels are with you, okay? Don't you worry. Many are they that rise up against me. Listen, my many, can you hear this song? Many are they that rise up against you. Hello. Prophesy the word of God. Don't prophesy junk. You prophesy the word of God and the truth. Amen. Money, money, money. Jesus' name and Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, sir. My glory I saw his faith. It's up to here. Your faith is strong, young man. Your faith is so strong. Don't worry, he's behind you. Your faith is strong. Your faith is strong. Wow, when I want prayer, I'm going to call you. Wow. Oh, and in Jesus' name, you leave this good man alone. Every foul spirit, they're not in you. Sometimes they torment you because you're such a good man. They want to take your faith down. You just remind them, my faith is spontaneous. It'll come and go when God says so. Peace of my mama. Stay there. Now. For me, Asa Mama Ma, the Lord is on you, baby. Just soak it in. Never interrupt God. Whatever He wants, He never interrupts it. Oh, God. 
will change starting tonight. It's impossible to mark your forehead with the Holy Spirit and be the same again. It'll be easier to say no and easier to read your Bible. Thank you. Okay, next week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you right now about this, but next week I'm going to give you each a copy of this for starters. And this shows you your sign, but the devil only tells you that you have one sign. God tells you that you have at least three, maybe four. And every one of them means something for your life. So I'll show you on this, and I'll give them to you, those to you next week. We're going to split it up. But where did I leave off? Can someone remind me what sign I left off with? Where I left off with Sagittarius? Okay. And Mama, I'm telling you, you stay put right there. She is in the spirit. I, you, whenever somebody falls over, just to let you know, this is how crazy I was years ago. I didn't know any better. I went to a healing ministry, and my girlfriend went, what? And I was over there, oh, 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 are you okay? Did you hit your head? Ha, ha, ha. And her husband came over and said, stop it. You never interrupt someone when God is talking to them. So that's why we leave them. And if she just sits there and soaks in the presence of God, you do it. I'm telling you, there's a call of God on that lady's life. When you have dreams and visions and dreams and visions, and they come from heaven, and everything she has told me of the dream and vision is the same very thing that the Lord was speaking to me. That's how I know. Well, one of the reasons I know they were from the Lord, because it was confirmation for both of us. Sagittarius, did you say? Okay. That's the one that we have to pick up on or we left off with? Okay, so we have, who's a Scorpius? Scorpio? All right, okay. So we have Scorpio. We're going to quick go through these Bible verses, and then we're going to watch a movie. And real quick, before we watch the movie, I want to tell you what it's about. There's a man named Ron Wyatt that wondered how true this Hey Assad was. He said, so many people doubt the Bible. And all, he, was, he worked in Tennessee. He was just a simple... I think a construction worker, and he had a little paycheck. But he set aside his paycheck and went over to Israel, went over to Egypt, went over everywhere the Bible said, and he said, I want to do some archaeology work and prove the Bible true or false. Real quick, this guy went to, he went to, do you remember when God came down on the mountain when he wrote the Ten Commandments? Remember that? And the Bible said he was a consuming fire. And he came down on the mountain and he burnt the mountain. So it said it's at one of the highest peaks in, and Paul said in the, book of, in the New Testament, he said it's in Arabia. Well, there's no country called Arabia, but there is a country called Saudi Arabia. So he went to Saudi Arabia and there was a burnt mountain. To this day. Do you remember when he came down the mountain and he saw his brother Aaron doing the golden calf and with all the people and they, okay, well, guess what happened? Yeah, the golden calf. They found the altar where the golden calf was being sacrificed because it had the calf written on it. Then they found the watering troughs for all the, the animals when they left Egypt and came. Oh, my goodness. Then they went to Sodom and Gomorrah, and they found Sodom and Gomorrah. This is messing up a little bit. It's okay. Then they found this ruined area where Sodom and Gomorrah were. And then they went to the Red Sea. And they put on their scuba diving, and they went right down to the bottom. And they found chariot wheels, horse jaws to prove right exactly where the children of Israel crossed over. Let me just say this, and I know you all have been there because you wouldn't be here if you, would, if you didn't. You know the path in life. You know the path. And all of a sudden you hear a voice that says from the Lord, not another voice. The Bible says, test the spirits. Go that way, Moses. Are you sure, Lord? I got 6 million people behind me. Some say there's 6,000. Some say there's 6 million. I got all this gold from Egypt. I got cattle and sheep. I'm sure Moses said, are you sure, Lord? Okay, so he got off the track and he went on a detour. And he went this way down the detour and he stopped. And in front of him was the Red Sea. Across there was Saudi Arabia. Here was Egypt. And they heard the chariot wheels coming. And all the children of Israel said, didn't, why didn't you leave us in the wilderness? Or why didn't you leave us in Egypt to die? Now we're going to get killed by Pharaoh in the wilderness. And he said, be quiet. Where is your faith? 
and he held up his hands and the rod. And that's when the water stood. God already had it all planned out because right in that area, there's built up sand where they crossed over on dry ground. And there had to have been 20 feet of water, 20 feet that was standing up in the air so they could all pass through. Crazy. He found the proof that this Hassad is true. If that proof didn't exist, people could question the Bible for years to come. So this is why we're watching this video. The man is dead now. He's in heaven. And he's looking over the archives. Of the last thing he found before he died, he was in Israel and he, had a, he woke up with a swollen ankle. And he was walking around limping and this Israeli felt sorry for him. And he says, uh, what can I do? He says, I'm an archaeologist and I need to take a shower. Forgive, forgive me, I stink a little bit. He says, but I'm waiting for my sons. We have to rearrange our flight tickets. And if you don't mind, I'm going to rest my foot here for a minute. And he said, as soon as he went to rest his foot, the Holy Spirit borrowed his tongue and his arm came out like this and he said, you see that right there? And that was Calvary, the cross of Calvary. They call it Golgotha. And actually on the stone, I've been there three times, on the stone is two eyes and a nose and a mouth. It's all like this. And it represents Jesus' face when they ripped his beard out. And it's, it's literally, it's not man-made, it's God-made in the stone above where the cross was. Well, when the earthquake happened, what happened was is the blood of Jesus dripped all the way down in where that skull is. And behind that skull is a prison. And it was Jeremiah's prison. In Hebrew, we call it grotto. So we call it Jeremiah's grotto. There's Jeremiah's grotto. And when the, when the bad guys, the Philistines, were coming to take everything, Jeremiah said, quick, we've got to save the Ark of the Covenant. We have to save, save all the furniture. There's seven pieces of furniture. And so they opened up the prison doors, and they shoved everything and put the, put the Ark in the back. Put the Ark in the back. So they quick shoved the Ark, and they put it in the back, and then they shoved all the other stuff in. And 2,000 years later, 1,000 years later, when the earthquake happened, the earth split right where Jesus was on the cross. And his blood came down and dripped all over the top of the Ark of the Covenant. The mercy seat. Y'all know what the mercy seat is? You know what a mercy It's the lid. And here's what it looks like. I know it's a small version of it. But there's a box underneath this. And this is where the Ten Commandments are. It's huge. It's huge. It's at least, it's at least this big. And then it has posts, three posts that come out this way. And the priest would pick it up because it was 100% gold. Can you imagine? Plus these heavy ten commandments are inside. Plus Aaron's rod. Plus this piece of bread that has lasted from heaven all these years. And God always told Moses, put the blood. I'm going to do it your way instead of my way as if I'm looking this direction. He said, always put the animal blood on this side because this side is preserved for my son. So when they put the Ark of the Covenant in the back, I'm going to turn it this way now. They put the Ark of the Covenant in the back. The earthquake came down and Jesus' blood dripped right here. And they call this, not a lid like we do in America, we call this the mercy seat. Okay? So here is what you're going to be studying tonight or looking at tonight. If it's, if it's too consuming for you, we'll show it again next time. But let me quickly get to the Bible verses. And then we'll get to the movie. Amen? You guys are all so good tonight. So tentative. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 15. That's the number one. Genesis 3, 1. Ooh. Revelation chapter 9, verse 3. Whoa. You guys are going to watch Michael crush the head of Satan, the Antichrist, during the tribulation. Revelation 9, verse 5 and verse 10. Revelation 12, if you're writing it down, Revelation 12, 9. If no one's writing it down, I'm going to skip on. Okay? And this is Numbers 21, 6 through 9. And John 3, 14. Okay, Taurus is amazing. Oh, my goodness. It's huge. It's huge, so I'm going to quick go through it, and I'll get with you all who are Tauruses. Him? I'll get every Taurus later. Okay. Um, Isaiah 34, 2 through 8. Hebrews 10, 13 through 14. Leviticus 1, 1 through 9. 
Taurus, it is also your job to assist the front row. Taurus, you also are assistant pastors. Taurus, you also lead worship. You are designed to be in the house of God. Period. Leviticus 3, you do something for the house of God. Leviticus 3, 1 through 6. Leviticus 4, 1 through 21. Your number one goal, or excuse me, your number one assignment from God is to serve. Isaiah 30, 23 through 24. This says you're very wealthy people. And if you're not, just get into line and God will help you. Isaiah, very wealthy people. Isaiah 32, 20. It's okay. It's all right. It's going to happen. Chingity, ching, ching. Not to the bank you go, but to the bank you own. That's God's plan for you. And don't think, oh, um, that's going to happen whenever. Listen, honey, we have a lot more years on this earth, even in the millennium, okay? Your fulfillment can even take place during the millennium. If the rapture happens this year, you make the rapture. Don't think that, you're, that your call is gone. No. So you are definitely into the money. Uh, it is the... the, the you know, now, have you ever heard... Think about this. Have you ever heard of really rich people choosing to go to church and choosing to serve? Uh, very rarely. <laughs> very rarely, because they're too busy worrying about their own. You see what I'm saying? But this is God's call for their life. That they not only have money, but they go right to the church and say, what can I do to help out? Oh, y'all need an organ up there? Okay, not only will I give you an organ, I'm going to stand here and sing in the choir. Amazing. Okay, Genesis 49.20. Deuteronomy 33. 24 and 25. 2 Corinthians 8 through 9. Philippians 2, 6, and, 6 to 8. There's a big one. Isaiah 25, 6. He says that you all eat the best that there is. You will eat better than other people. You eat the fat of the land, and you have a feast, not only in your bank account, but on your table. Psalms 104.5. Ooh, Ephesians 1.3. God will protect your money. Ephesians 1.3. Ephesians 1.8. Ephesians 3. Just the whole book of Ephesians. <laughs> it lists them all here. Ephesians all the way 1 through 6. Ephesians is actually a book for mature Christians. And it's one that are very smart people. Galatians is more simple. You start with Galatians and you go to Ephesians. Colossians 127, I love it. That's one of my favorite Bible verses. Colossians 127. Deuteronomy chapter 28, 1 through 14. Money, money, money. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. This, this is Taurus. This is Taurus. This is whose birthdays are right around right now. Yeah, right now because it's March. Yes, sir. Oh, okay, okay. All right, now. My, my uh, microphone keeps popping through. Okay, so now we go to 1 Kings chapter 10. Okay, now we go to the next part. Ooh. The same way God blesses you, if you do not do what he asks you to do, the absolute opposite happens. Deuteronomy 28, 15 to the end. It's not a good picture. Correct. Um, Leviticus chapter 26, 14 through 45. If you disobey the Bible doctrine, these things will happen. Okay, 1 Kings 21. 1 Corinthians 4. Revelation 18, Revelation 11. Now, satanic counterattacks. You all, because you have, basically you have spirit and 
funds. So two main powerful things that everybody on this earth that's a Christian asks for. Lord, give me the money to be able to help whenever somebody needs help, but I also need to be close to you to where my money is not my idol, my money is not my God, you are. They have it all, therefore the devil will attack them. And the Bible says you have a counterfeit, you have a shield, and you will punch him right back and win. You have the clout. You have the clout to do so. Okay, I'm just going to skip ahead. All of you will get a copy of your exact, um, I will give you a copy hopefully next week of every one of your exact um, things to take home with you. Yes. I don't know the sign right offhand, but I will get it to you. No worries, son. Are you the mechanic? You're the twin? Oh, check it out. You're the, twin. You're the oldest. Okay, I will. What is it, in April? She's October. I will look it up. Libra? I'll make sure she gets it. I'll make sure you get it. No worries. But the Bible verses, you will find that the Bible verses, Vir, Virgo, that's the last one we have to do. Who's Virgo in here? All right. <laughs> I love it. You know, Virgo is being used right now by the Lord. King Jupiter is going right through her and circling for 10 months. Comes out during Rosh Hashanah, the same time, same thing that happened when Jesus was born, and the same thing that happened 7,000 years ago. So when Jesus was born, it literally went in there for 10 months. 7,000 years ago, it just went in there like practiced and didn't come out. It was only like four or five months. But right now, it's 10 months, just like a woman's birth, and it comes out on the Feast of Trumpets. <laughs> Which means the rapture could happen during that, those three and a half days. It, no one knows the day or the hour, but we're supposed to know the season and the year. Time in the Bible means year. Okay, so Virgo. Okay. Da, 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 da. Okay, pure woman, obviously. And if you're a man, you're a pure man. You abstain from sexual immorality and you preach against it. Okay, let me go ahead and keep going. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 through 4. Deuteronomy 22, 23. 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 2, 15. Okay. Genesis 3, 15. Matthew 1, 23, Isaiah 7, 14. Usually Virgos, whether you're a male or a female, the devil attacks your marriage more than anything else. Every, every one of you, when you read your signs, you'll find out why you have more problems in this area than you do in that area. And you realize that it was written in the stars that this would happen to you or that you would like this or not like that when you step under his umbrella. But if you're out, it's not going to make sense because the things of the supernatural never make sense to the things of earth. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Let's just do a few more on this page. Matthew 19, 6, Mark 10, Romans 7, 1 Corinthians 7, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, Luke, thir Luke 23, and Revelation 6. And there's a lot more, but I will give them to you later when you hand, when we do those. So we will find out what October is. And if it's Leo, I'll make sure you get a copy of it because we already reviewed it last week and we have a movie to watch tonight. So who's ready to watch the, see the chariot wheels in the bottom of the Red Sea? Who's ready to see where the Ark of the Covenant was buried? And still is today. And what this, what's amazing, I just got to tell you a little clip. Deanna will be there in three minutes, okay? Just stay put until the movie's done, and hopefully none of you will fall asleep, but it's really good. <laughs> and I hope it looks, I hope it appears well. We'll turn off all the lights. Um, when he found the Ark of the Covenant, there were four big angels standing guard next to it. And you would wonder, why would there be four angels standing next to some Ark of the Covenant that's been hidden in a prison all these years? Why would these angels be necessary? There was no human being that got inside there. 
because the demons were trying to get to it. We are a minority, and they are the majority. The angels and the demons, the spirit realm is so much more vast than we are, and it's a constant battle every day, the angel and the demon fighting for your soul. So every time you say no, the angel wins. Every time you say yes, the demon wins. Make sure you choose right, because you have a part to play too. Remember the sandwich. You have a part. I can help you. The Holy Spirit can offer you the information, but you have to come and get it. Okay? All right, Deanna, let's play it. And I will see you again on Thursday. We have an awesome deliverance service on Thursday. So I'll see you at 6 o'clock on Thursday. Deanna, lights. the Exodus conjures up visions of ancient Egypt in all its glory. But to understand the Exodus and who the children of Israel were and why the events of the Exodus occurred, we must begin much earlier and much further north. After the flood, mankind was reborn through the family of Noah. As his family grew, once again knowledge of the true God was forsaken by the majority. Although given the command to go forth and replenish the face of the earth, a large group traveled from the east to a plain in Shinar where they built a city called Babel and began to build a tower that was supposed to reach to the heavens and save them in the event of another flood. But this contradicted God's purpose, and they soon confounded their languages, making it impossible for them to remain as one people. About 425 years after the flood, God called a man named Abram to leave his country, friends, and family, and good old man called Canaan. Because of his faithfulness to the true God, while the world around him fast fell to idolatry, the Lord made Abram a promise. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Abram lived in Ur of the Chaldees. There were several ancient cities by the name of Ur, but the phrase Ur of the Chaldees makes it clear which city was Abram's home. The Urituans worshipped a group of gods whom they called the Chaldees. Near Lake Van, several inscriptions have been found, one of which mentions 63 gods followed by 16 goddesses. One inscription states, This is the spoil of the cities which I obtained for the people of Chaldees in one year. Ur, today is called Urfa, and was in the plain of Shinar, where the great apostasy of Noah's family had fully bloomed into profound paganism. Abram's family had remained near Babel when the other groups had left the region. When he received the command to leave for Canaan, Abram gathered his family and left Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came into Haran and dwelt there. Ancient Haran, where they stopped and stayed until Abram's father died, still bears its ancient name and is located just 19 miles down the Balak River from ancient Ur. Further evidence of Abram, later called Abraham, in this region is the presence of the names of other members of his family, all still preserved within a radius of about 25 miles. His great-grandfather, Serug's, name is preserved in the town of Suruk, about 22 miles west of Haran. And between Haran and Urfa is Til Terahi, which means the ruin of Terah, who is Abraham's father. And of course, Haran was the name of Abram's brother, who was the father of Lot. Slowly at first, 
in Canaan, Abraham's family grew. His son Isaac bore two sons, Jacob and Esau. It was Jacob who would inherit the position of patriarch at Isaac's death, and it was his sons and grandsons who would one day formally become the nation called Israel. Among the twelve sons of Jacob, one was especially favored by him, Joseph. And unwisely, Jacob showed his favor by bestowing upon the boy a special coat of many colors, which caused great jealousy among the other sons. Their jealousy was made even greater by the dreams that Joseph had and shared with his family, dreams which indicated that he would one day occupy a position of great authority and that the others would bow down unto him. One day, when his older brothers were tending the flocks in Shechem, Jacob sent Joseph to see if all was well with them. When Joseph approached them from afar, the brothers' jealousy caused them to plot Joseph's death. Only his brother Reuben saved the 17-year-old's life by insisting that they not kill him, but instead cast him into a pit. Stripping him of his special coat, they did so, and when a company of Ishmaelites taking spices and balm to Egypt approached, they decided to sell their brother as a common slave to these men for 20 pieces of silver. But in spite of the horrendous betrayal and ordeal this young man suffered, Joseph remained faithful to the God of his fathers and became a shining light in a land of darkness. He accepted his life in this foreign land among a heathen nation and became a trusted servant to a high-ranking official of the Pharaoh. Then, Joseph was falsely accused of a terrible crime and was imprisoned. When all hope must have appeared lost, he was summoned to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams. The interpretation of those dreams by Joseph had warned of an impending seven-year famine, which was to follow a seven-year period of plenty. Deeply impressed by the young man, Pharaoh asked Joseph's advice on what to do to avert a great nationwide calamity. And because of the wisdom displayed in his reply, the Pharaoh appointed him to collect the grain and prepare for the famine. So grateful was the Pharaoh to Joseph and his God that he appointed Joseph to a position second only to the Pharaoh. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And it was through the obedience of Joseph that a special haven for the descendants of Abraham was provided. During the famine, Joseph's brothers came to Egypt to get grain. There, Joseph recognized his brothers, whom he had long ago forgiven. After he had tested them, he revealed his identity to the shocked and fearful sons of Jacob. When they realized Joseph intended no harm to them in spite of their grievous deed, they obeyed Joseph's command that they bring their father and entire family to Egypt. During the famine, Joseph had bought all the land of Egypt for the Pharaoh, except for land grants made to the various priests, and allowed the people to live on the land and return one-fifth of their increase to the king. When Jacob's family arrived, the Pharaoh honored Joseph by bestowing upon them the right to live in the best of the land of Egypt, the land of Goshen, which was the beautiful and fertile Nile Delta. It is also called the land of Ramses, or Ra, the creator, the sun god. And it was here that God's chosen people would grow and thrive from the 70 souls who came with Jacob until they became a great multitude. Though many have claimed there is no evidence of the story of Joseph in ancient Egypt, on an island just below the first cataract of the Nile, an ancient inscription written around the 4th century B.C. was found which claimed to be a copy of a document written by Pharaoh Djoser more than 1,000 years earlier. It is the story of a land grant made by the Pharaoh to the priests of the god Num. It tells of seven years of famine and seven years of plenty, how Pharaoh had a dream and consulted his chancellor for help, it contains most elements of the seven years of famine and seven years of plenty story, although they were corrupted in this account, written over 1,000 years after the event took place. But most importantly, the priests who wrote this inscription were relying upon the land grants made by this pharaoh to justify their claim to some land. They were not writing what they believed was an ancient myth. They obviously believed the land grants made by Pharaoh Djoser 
to still be valid and of enough authority to still be in effect well over 1,000 years later. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, only the land of the priests bought he not, for the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh. Ancient Egyptian records list Joseph as the 16th Pharaoh of Egypt, and historians have classified him with the so-called Third Dynasty. His chancellor, named Amhotep, was first known through the writings of the Egyptian historian Manetho, who in the 3rd century B.C. wrote, During Djoser's reign there lived a man named Amhotep, who had the reputation of the Greek god of medicine, and who invented the art of building with hewn stone. The legends attributed to Amhotep were so incredible that he was considered to be mythical until this century, when excavations at Djoser's pyramid complex revealed the base of a statue with the name Djoser on it and the name Amhotep, with his long list of titles, one of which was Chief Under the King, a title which first appears with Amhotep and also was first bestowed upon Joseph. Amhotep was also the architect of Pharaoh Joseph's pyramid and surrounding complex, a veritable city within a city of incredible beauty and extremely advanced in design. Built on the plateau of Saqqara adjacent to ancient Memphis, the pyramid within the complex is the first ever built in Egypt. Ron Wyatt spent a great deal of time here searching for evidence which might shed light on the biblical account. Such an event is the famine described in the story of Joseph, and the distribution of grain to the other countries would have required a major facility and system of organization. When the famine came and Joseph's brothers came from Canaan to get grain from Egypt, we are told that they went to Joseph, which indicates that he personally oversaw the distribution, at least to those coming from foreign countries and this would mean that there was certainly a central location or granary to which the foreigners came. The complex at Saqqara contains 11 massive pits which even the Egyptians are at a loss to explain. They are not tombs, for all tombs were underground and carefully sealed, while these were accessible from the surface, and they are extremely large. But most fascinating, is the fact that they are all connected by chutes. Ron believes these were the grain storage pits of the seven-year famine. As grain was removed from one pit, grain from the other pits flowed through the chutes, making the grain always accessible from one location. These are within the wall of the step pyramid complex, which has only one entrance and it opens to a long covered passageway with small cubicles on each side, each just the right size for a person to sit with perhaps a small table. The narrow, singular entrance would have allowed only a few people to enter at a time. There was no doubt in Ron's mind that this was the main center of grain distribution on a massive scale. to get their grain, the people lined up to enter the long corridor. Once inside, they paid one of the cashiers in one of the cubicles for the amount of grain they wished to purchase. After payment was made, perhaps they were given a sack for grain which reflected the amount of their payment. Then they proceeded through the corridor, straight to the area of the grain bins.
seats there. They descended the stairway next to the storage bins, handed their sack to a worker who filled it and returned it to them. Then they exited through a small door on the lower level, which led to the outside of the complex. the pits were first excavated, bits of grain still remained in them, but the official explanation was that it was the remains of food placed in graves for the deceased. However, as we mentioned, these bear no resemblance to any ancient Egyptian tombs, but they do bear a marked resemblance to pits identified as grain storage bins in other ancient civilizations. During the seven-year famine, Egypt gained great wealth and prominence among the nations through the selling of the grain. The Egyptians who lived in their cities along the Nile had little to do during the famine since they had a seven-year supply of grain to rely on and were able to devote their time to the building projects of the pharaoh, not as slaves, but as grateful subjects. The family of Jacob, who lived in the Delta, separate from the native population, prospered and grew, exempt from the one-fifth taxation levied on the native population. From the time Jacob's family came to Egypt until the birth of Moses was about 180 years. Many pharaohs had come and gone, many ruling contemporaneously with others in different regions. But until now, all recognized the rights granted to the people of Israel to live in the land of Ramses. But that was about to change. Exodus 1.8 There arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Israel had remained a separate race from the Egyptians and had grown and prospered to such an extent that they were viewed as a potential enemy nation right in the midst of Egypt. But the Pharaoh didn't want to banish the Israelites because they were skilled craftsmen adding great wealth to the nation. By oppressing them with the bondage of hard labor, he sought to subdue them and crush their spirit. When this failed, the king then sought to decrease their number by issuing a decree that every Hebrew male born alive was to be cast into the river and drowned. It was at this time that Moses was born and hid by his mother in an ark of bulrushes placed in the river and rescued by the Pharaoh's own daughter. Raised as the Pharaoh's grandson, he was considered part of the royal family, but his loyalties remained with his own people. When Moses killed an Egyptian for smiting a fellow Hebrew, he incurred the wrath of his adopted grandfather, the Pharaoh, and he fled Egypt to Midian. There he married the daughter of Jethro, the priest of Midian, a worshiper of the true creator. Forty years later, he was called of God at the burning bush to lead his now enslaved people out of Egypt. The rest of the story is well known, but the apparent lack of any evidence has led scholars to either doubt the truth of the entire story, to try to downplay the events and explain them in terms of natural science, or explain them as normal events which were blown out of proportion. Ron Wyatt believed they occurred exactly as the Bible stated. After the final plague, which took the lives of the firstborn throughout all of Egypt, Pharaoh called Moses and said, Rise up and get you forth from among the people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said, and take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. With sandaled feet and staff in hand, the people of Israel had stood hushed, awed, yet expectant, awaiting the royal mandate that they should bid them go forth. Before the morning broke, they were on their way. The Israelites had been scattered throughout the empire of Egypt by this time. As slaves, they were bound to go wherever they were told to work for the Pharaoh. But during the plagues, they had all slowly returned to Goshen or Ramses. Exodus 12:37, And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. They journeyed from the land of Ramses, or Goshen, and encamped or gathered at Succoth. 
When the people were given the Feast of Unleavened Bread, God told them, For in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. This scripture clearly told Ron that they left Egypt that very day and that Sukkoth was outside of Egypt proper. Many Egyptologists and scholars agree that the ancient Egyptian frontier fortress called Thiru or Thaku was ancient Sukkoth of the Exodus account as it corresponds linguistically with the Hebrew word. Thaku was the last Egyptian city on the northeastern border and was where the ancient pharaohs organized their armies as they prepared to go to war to the north and east. It was the only place large enough for several million people with their flocks and herds to be gathered together. And the journey of such a massive group would have been impossible without order, and Ron believed that it was at Sukkoth or Thaku that they were organized for travel. Here their journey began, but where were they going? Moses had asked to take the people three days' journey out of the land of Egypt to worship the true God. But by the command of God, Moses knew they would not return. He had been in Midian when he had seen the burning bush and had been called by the Lord to deliver his people out of bondage. And though he had been told he would lead them to the promised land, they were first to come to Mount Sinai, for God had told him, Exodus 3.12, This shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Many scholars agreed that Midian was in the northwest sector of present-day Saudi Arabia, but they somehow missed the fact that Mount Sinai was also in Midian. So, from Sukkoth, they set out for Midian and Mount Sinai. But the direct route which would take them directly east since they had to go around the eastern finger of the Red Sea was too dangerous. Exodus 13, 17 And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. The Philistines lived along the coasts. Ancient records show peaceful relations between the Philistines and Egypt at this time, but had they encountered the Israelites, they would have regarded them as escaping slaves and captured them to return them to Egypt. Therefore, God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. Throughout known history, the desolate peninsula located between the two fingers of the Red Sea has remained uninhabited except for small, isolated groups of Bedouin. The ancient Egyptians operated mines there, but the conditions for life were so terrible that one official left a steely behind telling of his experiences there. Quote, The highlands are hot in the summer and the mountains brand the skin. In this desolate and forbidding region, nestled between the two fingers of the northern end of the Red Sea, was quite reasonably called in the biblical account the wilderness of the Red Sea. Instead of taking the people across the flat northern plain, Moses led them through the more mountainous region where they were protected by the mountains. At the end of three days, when the Israelites continued their journey, instead of returning in the direction of Egypt, Spies and lookouts flashed signals across the mountains. Exodus 14.5 And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. When they arrived at Etham, in the edge of the wilderness, they had almost reached the northern tip of the arm of the Red Sea called the Gulf of Aqaba. But it was here that God had another plan for his people. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihahirath, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Zephon. Before it shall ye encamp by the sea, for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land, the wilderness hath shut them in. And they continued their present course, 
they would have soon reached safety. But instead they turned south and entered into a massive group of mountains that were without escape. The winding 18-mile-long canyon, today called Wadi Watir, twisted towards the seashore at times less than 100 feet wide. It constantly looked like a dead end up ahead, but as they continued their journey, the mountains would seem to open up as they approached. Pharaoh knew the area and felt confident when he stated, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness hath shut them in. Once they entered the Wadi Watir, there was no way out until they reached the sea. God had foretold how long their flight from the Egyptians would be when he gave them the feast of the unleavened bread, or bread of haste, which lasted seven days. From Sukkoth to the beach at the Red Sea is about 140 miles. Could they have traveled this far in such a short time? Exodus 13:21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. Traveling both day and night, they would have had only to average about one mile per hour or 24 miles a day to reach the sea in six days. Once they arrived at the sea, they encamped, but in great fear, for here they certainly felt trapped stories of the ordeal must have been passed down through many generations for 1500 years later the Jewish historian Josephus wrote quote, for there was a ridge of mountains that terminated at the sea which were impassable by reason of their roughness in their flight the enormous beach at present day Nueva is certainly large enough to have held several million people in their flocks and to the south the mountains extend to the sea, making further travel impossible. When Ron first explored this beach in 1978, he saw the mountains of which Josephus wrote that blocked further travel to the south. To the north, he found the very ancient remains of an old Egyptian fortress, most likely built as an outpost for troops assigned to protect the Egyptian mine workers in the region from attacks from the north. The old structure remained in use for many, many years, as it had been repaired many times. Ron believes this was Pihahirath. Many people believe that the parting of the Red Sea could only have occurred at a place where it is relatively shallow. Perhaps that is why most people believe it took place at the Gulf of Suez, which is quite shallow compared to the Gulf of Aqaba, which in some places is 5,000 feet deep. It is also about eight miles across from the beach at Nueva. The few bathymetric maps Ron was able to find showed that the depths from the Nueva beach to the opposite shore reached a maximum of about 900 feet, gently sloping, while on each side there were sheer drops to about 5,000 feet. There certainly appeared to be an underwater path which could have been traveled with the water removed. When Ron and the boys first came to Nueva, they went to the south end of the beach. There, Ron found a Phoenician-style column lying in the sand near the water's edge. Examining it, he saw that there were no inscriptions still legible. Water erosion had damaged it beyond any repair. At that time, the Sinai was being occupied by the Israelis, and they were in the process of using dynamite to level part of the mountains that reached the gulf in order to drive their tanks along the coast. Ron pointed out the fallen column to an army officer, and the next time he returned, he found they had moved it back from the beach and set it in concrete. He would later learn the significance of that long column. He and the boys then donned their scuba gear and began to investigate what may lie beneath the waters of the crystal clear gulf. The biblical account told of Pharaoh's army being drowned when the parted waters rushed together. In Exodus 14:24, further tells that the Lord, quote, took off their chariot wheels, that they drave them heavily. 
On the first dive, Ron found chariot wheels preserved by the coral which had attached to it. He found an axle with portions of each wheel still present, one lying flat and the other extending several feet above the ground. These chariot wheels were very difficult to see and recognize because they are covered in coral, and the portions that were not covered have disintegrated. Most wheels he found had six spokes. However, he found several eight-spoked wheels. He removed this one and took it to Nassif Hassan, who was then head of antiquities in Cairo. With no hesitation, he told Ron it was from the 18th dynasty. Thinking his answer a bit quick and perhaps too casual, Ron inquired how he could make such an identification upon first sight. Mr. Hassan explained that the ancient Egyptians only used the eight-spoked wheel at one time in all their history, during the 18th dynasty. In February of 1988, he found this gold four-spoke chariot wheel in the same general area. There is no coral on the main part of the wheel, because coral doesn't attach to gold. Only around the hub area where some wood was exposed when it came off the chariot. While the style of this wheel is similar to that found on the walls of ancient Egyptian tombs depicting chariot making, it also bears a resemblance to ancient Assyrian chariot wheels, which also provides a very important evidence. The abundant evidence shows that there was only one period in ancient Egyptian history when four, six, and eight-spoke chariot wheels were used. In his article, Observations on the Evolving Chariot Wheel in the 18th Dynasty, James K. Hoffmeyer in 1976 explains that it was only at the beginning of the 18th Dynasty that the chariot comes into use in the Egyptian army. He also relates how it was only during the 18th Dynasty that the four, six, and eight-spoked wheels were used and that monuments can actually be dated by the number of spokes in the wheel. Exodus 14, 6. And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. The Pharaoh took with him every chariot in Egypt, his own, his captains who headed the divisions, and a group called his chosen chariots, which seemed to be in addition to his regular army. There is an inscription of Ramses Meriamun that tells that he had an army of 20,000 troops which was divided into four divisions. This implies that each division consisted of 5,000 troops. But many times the pharaoh took more than just soldiers into battle. The priesthood and the military were closely associated. The Egyptian government was a combination church and state, so to speak. There were many, many gods in ancient Egypt but the ultimate god was the one represented as the sun and known throughout the various times as Ammon, Atin, and Ra or Re, among other names. It was this ultimate god that the pharaoh was considered the earthly embodiment of. The divisions of the army were named after the gods. For example, the first army, that of Ammon, the army of Ra, the army of Ta, and the army of Sutek. When the army set out to war, elaborate ceremonies were performed at the temples, asking the various gods to give them victory over their foes. Then, booty that was gained as a result of victories was dedicated to the priesthood and temples of the deities. All military victories were directly attributed to the favor of the gods. Many times, if an upcoming battle was considered to be particularly important or difficult, the priests of the various gods would accompany the army to the battlefield in hopes that the god or gods would show special favor in their endeavors. When the pharaoh set out after the children of Israel, he had seen the power of the true god, the great I Am, during the terrible plagues. If the Egyptian army ever needed supernatural intervention by the hands of their so-called gods, it was at this time. Since the gold veneered chariot wheel Ron found was on the Egyptian side of the gulf, this indicates that it was at the rear of the army. A priest who is not trained in battle would most certainly be in this position at the rear. Okay, we're out here at the beach that the Israelites came out on when they 
came out of the canyon system that they had been following by the leading of the cloud and of course following Moses who was following the cloud and they came out on this beach and proceeded to the south which is this direction there was an old Egyptian fortress up to the left Piharoth and so they turned southward and of course the cloud turned southward and that was what they were following Soon after entering this area, the Israelites set up camp beside the sea whose waters presented a seemingly impassable barrier before them, while on the south, a rugged mountain obstructed further progress. With all areas of escape blocked, the Israelites felt they were doomed. Suddenly they beheld in the distance the flashing armor and moving chariots betokening the advance guard of a great army. As the force drew nearer, the hosts of Egypt were seen in full pursuit. Terror filled the hearts of Israel. Some cried unto the Lord, but far the greater part hastened to Moses with their complaints. Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. It was not an easy thing to hold the host of Israel in waiting before the Lord. Lacking discipline and self-control, they became violent and unreasonable. They expected speedily to fall into the hands of their oppressors, and their wailings and lamentations were loud and deep. The wonderful pillar of cloud had been followed as the signal of God to go forward. But now they questioned among themselves if it might not foreshadow some great calamity. For had it not led them on the wrong side of the mountain into an impassable way? Thus the angel of God appeared to their deluded minds as the harbinger of disaster. But now, as the Egyptian host approached them, Expecting to make them an easy prey, the cloudy column rose majestically into the heavens, passed over the Israelites, and descended between them and the armies of Egypt. A wall of darkness interposed between the pursued and their pursuers. The Egyptians could no longer discern the camp of the Hebrews, and they were forced to halt. But as the darkness of night deepened, the wall of cloud became a great light to the Hebrews, flooding the entire encampment with the radiance of day. Then hope returned to the hearts of Israel, and Moses lifted up his voice unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. From the Red Sea, the great multitude continued their journey, which would take them to Mount Sinai. The Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 4.25, For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. The traditional Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula was identified as such by Helena, mother of Constantine. This Roman emperor who converted to Christianity in 312 A.D. claimed to have had supernatural revelations and visions, some of which revealed to him the locations of several biblical events. 
he sent his mother Helena to the Middle East where she pointed out the locations her son had seen in his visions. Then in 527 AD, the Emperor Justinian built the monastery of St. Catherine's on the northwest slope of Jabal Musa in the Sinai Peninsula. On the site, he claimed that Helena had erected a small church two centuries earlier. The identification of this mountain rests only on a dream of a heathen convert who sent his mother to identify the mountain based only on his description over 1,700 years after the Exodus. When Ron found the chariot remains in 1978, he knew that the real Mount Sinai was in Arabia, just as Paul had written. He applied for a visa to enter Saudi Arabia and go to Jabal el Laz, the highest mountain in the rugged region along the eastern shore of the Gulf. But after four years of silence at his request, in January of 1984, he and his sons entered the country illegally by walking across the Jordanian border. Hitchhiking and hiring taxis, they made their way to Jabal el Laz. There, Ron saw enough evidence to know he had the right mountain, but his excitement was soon dampened when a Bedouin in a pickup truck hastily drove up and told their driver they had to leave immediately for the border. When they arrived at the border, they were arrested. The charge? Espionage for the State of Israel. Over and over, Ron explained why he was there, and late one afternoon, they took him in a helicopter and told him to show them where he believed the great multitude crossed the sea. He directed them to the beach directly opposite Nueva, where he could clearly see from the air. They landed, and close to the helicopter was a Phoenician-style column, still standing, with inscriptions in archaic Hebrew. The Saudis made numerous photos, chattering excitedly, and Ron explained that he believed it was erected in ancient times to mark the crossing site and told them that he had found an identical one on the opposite shore whose inscriptions had been eroded away since it had fallen in the surf. That column probably saved Ron and the boys' lives. It was the shred of evidence that gave his story credence. But it was 78 days before they were cleared of the bogus charges, which Ron later learned were phoned into the Saudi embassy by an acquaintance who had once worked with him on several projects. Three weary Americans came home Monday night. Ronald Wyatt and his sons Daniel and Ronald Jr. returned in Nashville at the end of an amateur archaeology expedition that landed them in a Saudi Arabian jail. They entered Saudi Arabia illegally searching for the site of the biblical Mount Sinai. Ronald Wyatt and his sons are with us in the studios of our Nashville affiliate WTVF to tell us all about it. Gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Wyatt, you there in the middle, yes. <laughs> your sons on either side. Why did you, uh, I didn't know that Mount Sinai was in Saudi Arabian territory. Why did you think it was? Uh, we found some chariot parts that looked like the chariots uh, found in King Tut's tomb uh, in the Gulf of Aqaba, west of this Jabal el Laws. Uh, we found these at depths from 60 feet out to 200 feet and over a stretch of about a mile and a half. And uh, we believe that that was the crossing site. And so uh, in the biblical, bi biblical narrative, they arrived at Mount Sinai after crossing the Red Sea. Uh, the language in the Bible indicates that they stayed in a mountain, enclosed in a mountain, so an aerial map showed that this Jabal el Laws had a large valley enclosed in the rim of an ancient volcano. There's about 5,000 acres in there. We felt this was the place. And in uh, Exodus 24, 4, and in Leviticus 6, 28, 11, 33, and 15, 12, uh, it tells of some artifacts that were to be found. There was to be 12 pillars of stone and an altar and some pottery. And so uh, this is why we looked at that particular mountain. Now, I know that you applied for a visa for about four years. It's very difficult to get into Saudi Arabia, and they turned you down, but then you decided to make a quick, uh, and let's ask Daniel this. We'll give him a chance to talk a quick jump across the border in Jordan and get it, go in illegally. Do you think you could uh, get in and out without being caught? Uh, I don't know. Gotta take it seemed kind of risky to me. Yeah, I didn't think it sounded too easy. 
Ronald Jr., why do you think they let you go, finally? Uh, I'm not real sure. I guess they just found out that we weren't spies as they thought we were. They thought you were Israeli spies, right? Yeah, that's what we hear. Any torture kind of interrogation? Uh, no. They just separated us and made sure our stories uh, matched. Uh, yes. Uh, during the interrogation period, we were interrogated by three separate gr groups, the Coast Guard and then the local uh, general investigating group and then uh, from the ministry. And uh, the Coast Guard interrogation was a uh, very frightening experience for people that uh, were totally inexperienced with spies and intrigue and all of this. Are you going to go back? Uh, we're not going back without uh, the proper papers. The, the Wyatts, thank you very much for joining us from Nashville this morning. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank nice you. to be back. <laughs> Uh, the Coast Guard is in charge of customs, and they were the ones that arrested us. They uh, took us down to their Coast Guard headquarters, mm -hmm. and uh, we met some people there that were quite friendly at first, but we found that uh, they weren't all this friendly. Uh, we went through some uh, three different uh, periods of uh, interrogation, and uh, the first was by this Coast Guard group. They had a general there that was commanding this, mm -hmm. and he uh, interviewed us or interrogated us through an interpreter. And I've never yet been quite convinced that the interpreter told him <laughs> that's what he was saying. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, after that, then we were uh, interrogated by the general investigating office. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in charge of that area. Uh, they, I think their office is in Tobuk. And then after that, uh, they sent some people out from the ministry. This is the kings uh, from Riyadh, mm -hmm. you know, the seat of the government, and uh, had a few questions for us too. And during this time, of course, they kept us separated so we couldn't get our stories together or whatever. They didn't tell us a whole lot. We were held incommunicado. They declined uh, allowing us to uh, talk with a representative of our government, which uh, international law requires that uh, they do. And uh, so we were pretty much in the dark. They would, uh, after the preliminary or the main interrogation, Periodically, they would take one or the other of us up to this uh, head honcho's office and ask mm -hmm. us a few more questions. And I think they were getting these questions from their archaeology department. They were mm -hmm. seeing if we really were archaeologists <coughs> or if we were Israeli spies, which is what they accused us of being. Well, in Numbers 24-4, uh, for the people in the audience that are Bible uh, scholars, it says that Moses rose up early in the morning and set up 12 pillars of stone and erected an altar. Mm -hmm. uh, we felt that this would still be there because uh, people in that part of the country, uh, the Bedouins and a lot of these people, their agreements, instead of being on paper, they set up these little uh, things of stone, mm -hmm. which apparently they have some means of interpreting what these little stacks of stones mean. And uh, so all these things are uh, left alone. They're not necessarily sacred, but they are just mm -hmm. things that, you know, people do not bother. We felt that there was a high likelihood that those stones would still be there, and so we found those. And they appeared to be intact. There had been some sand blown in over uh, up partway on the north end of the altar and some of the stones on that end. Soon after arriving home, Ron received a call from a Saudi Bedouin prince by the name of Sumron. He had heard about Ron's claim after his release and had become obsessed with seeing what he called Moses Mountain. Moses is recognized by the Muslim faith as a true prophet. Sumron even flew to Nashville, determined to convince Ron to return with him. And finally, 11 months after his release from Saudi prison, Ron relented. In March 1985, Ron journeyed to Turkey to show a new associate, David Fassel, the site of Noah's Ark. Samran joined them and the three viewed the remains of the Ark in the snow. Ron was then provided a visa to enter Saudi legally, and Mr. Fassold was invited to join them, an offer he did not refuse. 
With a full work crew and provisions, they went to the mountain where they thoroughly explored the area. An archaeologist from Riyadh University was brought in and verified the archaeological value of the site. Ron was asked to stay and excavate, but he had other meetings in Turkey which couldn't be changed. His refusal angered the Saudis who are not used to being told no, and all of their photos, film and video were confiscated. Ron was told they would be returned to them when he returned and excavated as they had requested. After he left, the area was fenced off and signs erected stating it was an archaeological site and trespassing forbidden, but once again he left empty-handed. He began to make plans to return as they had requested and met with former astronaut James Irwin to enlist the participation of his organization. But future requests, both by Ron and Colonel Irwin on his behalf, were met with refusals. With time to reflect upon the situation, the Saudis had decided it was not in their best interest for Mount Sinai to be in their country. Three years later, a member of Jim Irwin's organization, along with one of their financiers, succeeded in getting into the country and getting some photos, having gotten complete directions and details from Mr. Fasselt. They then made the claim that they had discovered Mount Sinai. But it wasn't to be long before Ron would have more documentation than he ever dreamed possible. The story is too long to be told here, but by 1992, the photos and videos he so desperately desired literally fell into his hands. However, for now, we must protect the identity of those who took the photos and videos and gave them freely to Ron with no stipulations. Exodus 14.30 Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. The waters of the sea had closed in on Pharaoh and his army, and now many of their bodies lay lifeless upon the vast Arabian shore. His charioteers and horsemen, their swords and weapons, were bound to their bodies and were gathered up by the unarmed Israelites. The mountain of God lay to their southeast, an easy journey through the large wadi just beyond the marker where Ron found the column in 1984. But had they proceeded directly to the mountain from the sea, they would have entered the large open plain and been an easy prey to the fierce warring Amalek. Instead, the biblical account tells of a different route through the wilderness of Etham, also called the wilderness of Shur, the mountainous region which surrounded the shores of the Gulf. For three days they followed the cloud through the barren wilderness. As their water supply grew scarce, they became fearful. Then they came to Marah, where there was a spring, but the water was bitter and undrinkable. The people murmured against Moses, blaming him, even though they were being led by the cloud and the pillar of fire. When Moses prayed for wisdom as to what to do, he was shown a tree by the Lord which he was told to cast into the waters, and which made them sweet and drinkable. Such a time as this, International Alleluia Ministries presents the ministry of Dr. Gabriel Hope. You see, when I knew the power of speaking the word of God, that's power. Everything else is negative, but that equals power. So I threw his little power in the and said, You will live and not die. He says, Call those things that be not as though they are. Sometimes you just have to be told two to three times. Write it down as if it's, if it's already happened. Thank you, Daddy. It's not going to. It's already done. He said it's finished. He didn't say to be. Take what the devil has given you and turn it into good. Give us this day our daily bread. Her trip to heaven will amaze you. Squished me into him. I felt the creator of the universe melt. 
Dr. Gabriel Hope and I Am Ministries begin with the one-on-one -on -one visit to heaven with the Father. And now an impartation of this love, compassion, power, and joy is imparted into all those who attend the I Am meetings. Healings, miracles, and liberty manifest during these meetings. But the highlight is when unanswered prayers come into fruition immediately. People from across the globe are lining up to meet the God that changed the life of Dr. Gabriel Hope. That if they'd only stand in unity, the fire would be unmeasurable. But it's the devil's job to get us too busy and too angry with each other to get along. That jealousy and pride has to weave itself in there. Enough is enough is enough. Father, I need a GI. I need a God idea. Will you please impart to me something that will set me financially for the rest of my life? But listen, don't limit him. He's a God of diversity. He says, wait a minute. Why do you ask me for one? I'm a king. I own a cattle on a thousand hills. Ask me for more. I just smelled the Holy Spirit all over her. Pray in tongues. Father, I thank you for these God ideas birthing. Where's Come on, my put your hands together. Dr. Gabriel Hope has been welcomed into the Arab in hands with her main ministry focus she sat on the for land nearly of two decades. With the favor Dr. Dr. Hope has been inspired Royal by many, She's including Reinhard Bonke, T.L. Osborne, Jordan. Billy Graham, and His Majesty King Hussein of Jordan, just to name a few. Dr. Hope supports orphanages and caretakers at SOS villages in Amman, Jordan, and all over the world. But most importantly, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ bursts forth in Gabriel Hope's healing festivals and miraculous signs and wonders follow. The dead have been raised and blinded eyes have been opened supernaturally. We can save the world. the devil intends for bad, God will turn for good. Because I have the fullness of God in me, it doesn't matter what happens to me, I know. Dr. Gabriel Hope is the host of three TV shows on the Royal Steps Network. She is the author of 12 books, co-producer of the upcoming feature film Royal Steps, and a music artist and songwriter, among others. Yet, if you ask Dr. Hope, why do you exude such grace, joy, and confidence? Her answer is, because I have sat on my heavenly daddy's lap. And if you ask her, who is your heavenly father? She will boldly reply, he is the Lion of Judah, the Great Lion.